Thanks, Karen. Well done. <clears throat> well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would uh, speak to us by your word and please help us as, through what we hear. Uh, help us to engage with what you are saying to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, over the past six months, many of us have become amateur immunologists um, just by reading the news, and you may have an opinion on the strategies that the government has been taking to con control and contain the virus. Uh, from what I can tell, there's a few different strategies that were available to the government. There's the eradication strategy, uh, which is to shut everything down and lock everyone in their homes until it goes away by itself. Then there's the, suppress uh, the suppression strategy, uh, which is just do enough to keep infections down and manage the, the certain number of cases until a vaccine arrives. Uh, and that's what we have been doing, as I understand it. And then there's the herd immunity strategy, which is just try to protect the vulnerable, but let the virus just run its course, and then it'll be past us. Now, if you read the news, you'll be uh, familiar with the different arguments, uh, which... Um, uh, you know, about what should be done, and uh, you may have an opinion on how big a problem it, it would be anyway. Um, and so there's a fair bit of controversy. What do we do with the virus? How much of it do we tolerate? Well, today we're looking at Christ's letter to this church in Thyatira, uh, which was infected by sin and seemed to be permitting a certain amount of it, at least, to occur. It's possible that they had a suppression strategy towards sin, a certain amount is tolerable, or maybe even there was something of a herd immunity strategy amongst some of them, uh, let's just let sin run its course, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about as we go through the letter. But this letter, I think, gives us three reasons why when it comes to sin, it's the eradication strategy that we need to take as Christians, no matter what the cost is. We cannot tolerate any sin in the church. Now, of course, there will be sin in the church because we're all sinful and we all sin all the time, uh, but we mustn't let it live. Uh, that is, whenever it pops up, it needs to be repented of and it needs to be taken to Jesus rather than being allowed to fester and grow. Well, there is a sin and I know that it's there and I'm just going to leave it there. No, that can't be our attitude to sin. So this uh, letter to Thyatira gives us three reasons why we should take a zero-tolerance attitude to sin in our lives and in our church. The first reason is that this letter reminds us that we are easily led into moral confusion. Uh, the letter to Thyatira has a structure that's familiar to us by now. There's the introduction and then there is a commendation uh, to the church for what it's doing well. And then there is a rebuke to the church and then there's the promise to the one who overcomes. So here the first thing that Jesus says to them after the introduction is that they were getting many things right. He says in verse 19, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now think about it, and that is a really big tick for this church. Um, you'll remember that the church in Ephesus was told to repent and do the works you did at first. Uh, their first love was gone. But in Thyatira, they were doing more than ever for Christ. And he knew their faith and their love and their service and their perseverance. I think it's worth reflecting on um, the idea of doing more than you did at first for us as Christians. Many Christians, many churches just do the same thing that they've always done. And that's faithfulness for them. It's maintaining what they've done. Uh, we often don't achieve it if that's our aim. And we end up doing less and less. The faith grows weak, the love grows cold, the service is resented and perseverance gets harder um, if we're just trying to maintain. But here is a group of people who were growing. They were doing more than they did at first. Christ saw their faith and their love. And that's very impressive. They were getting many things right, this church in Thyatira. But there was one glaring issue which exposed their weakness when it came to sin and holiness. And that is Jezebel's deception. So it seems there was a woman in the church who claimed to be a prophetess, that is to speak for God, who was leading some people into total moral confusion. Her real name probably wasn't Jezebel, but Jesus calls her that because the Jezebel of the Old Testament was a very nasty, dangerous person. She was married to King Ahab, Ahab um, 
but it seems she wore the pants, uh, and she ruthlessly and murderously tried to take, to remove God from Israel. That is, to make Israel a completely pagan nation. Um, and so not many people would call their daughters Jezebel these days, and there's a reason for that. She was a, she was a really rotten sort of person. Now, this woman who lived in Thyatira was called Jezebel by Jesus because she was trying to turn the church pagan um, in Jesus' eyes. She deceived Christians into engaging in the sexual immorality and the pagan feasts of the religions around them. Uh, it's possibly the same teaching as the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, whom um, we've, we've seen in the previous letters. And it says in verse 20, Jesus says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So she's trying to lead the church into paganism or at least compromise with paganism. And this would have been attractive uh, for the Christians in Thyatira and not just because of the lusts that it would have permitted them to indulge. Uh, Thyatira was a trading town, a uh, town of industry, and to get any business, you had to be part of a local trade guild in those days, uh, of which there were plenty, apparently, in Thyatira. For example, if you were a leather worker, if you wanted to get work and if you wanted to get supplies, you needed to be part of the Leather Workers Guild. Uh, but the Leather Workers Guild had its own gods, and it had religious rites and religious sacrifices that it made to its gods, and it had feasts, which could involve sexual activity as part of these sort of drunken, orgy-like feasts, and unless you signed up for the guild and for all of that, then you weren't in the club and you had no chance of running a business in the town if you're a leather worker. So this was a matter of feeding your family, not just a matter of indulging your lusts uh, to be part of this guild and to sort of sign up for all of this. And it seems that Jezebel was telling the Christians that it's okay to take part in these things and uh, it seems she was leading by example as well in taking part of all of these things and some were believing her and following her. In verse 24... It says uh, that this involved learning the so-called deep secrets of Satan. So, um, I mean, obviously it's speculative what that meant, but it seems at least there was a body of theory behind what she was saying to these people. Um, maybe it involved the idea that in order to defeat Satan, you have to get really acquainted with his ways. Um, if you're going to beat sin, you have to really know sin. And how can you really know sin unless you do it? Maybe that's what she was saying. And to, off, uh, to us, obviously, this is, this is a bit dodgy. But the point that I want to make is that we are easily led into moral confusion. If there's some pressure on us, if there's some desire there for us, if there's someone who is an attractive personality who can construct a half-plausible argument and use some Bible verses along the way, then we're often a good chance of going for it if it's the sort of thing that we're looking for anyway. Uh, think of the people who get sucked into weird cults uh, these days because they're offered something that they really feel that they need, uh, they're bewitched, there's attractive personalities involved, they believe and do whatever they're told and their moral compass gets completely uh, confused. Or in mainline churches like ours perhaps where people decide to take a different view on some moral issue, maybe it's sexuality, maybe it's prosperity or something like that, and they develop their arguments, and they twist the scriptures, and they play on people's sympathies. And no one wants to say no to them because we're nice people, and because they're very well liked, and they're respected, and they're relied upon, and they would be a great loss to the church in some ways. No one wants to lose them. So the issue grows in the church like cancer. It seems that's what was happening in Thyatira, around this Jezebel woman. They were getting many things right but some were being very morally confused by what was going on. Um, did you know that uh, with... In, in, you probably heard this before, but with inexperienced aeroplane pilots, it's very possible for them to fly into a cloud... I checked this on the, on the internet, so it's true... <laughs> and they become so disoriented inside this cloud um, that they, when they fly out of the cloud, they can be completely upside down. The plane, the plane can be upside down flying out of the cloud... I'm not going to look at Arcos because he would know the truth of the matter. But anyway, they stop looking at their instruments and they lose all kind of sense of where the ground is, what's up and what's down. Um, the fact that this can happen to us morally is a good reason to keep checking the Bible and adopt the simple rule 
that if it says sin is okay, even a little bit, then it is wrong and you need to have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Our potential for moral confusion is a good reason for us to take a zero tolerance approach to sin. It's pretty simple, sin is wrong and we shouldn't do it. Um, The second reason here is that Jesus is never confused about this and Jesus is the judge. And that's very clear here in this letter, that's perhaps the main theme, is that Jesus the judge. Um, The fact that Jesus always sees sin and error for what it is, and he is always repulsed by sin, should make us think twice before we sort of take a casual attitude towards sin and dodginess. Yes, we're saved by grace, yes, we are forgiven if we're in Christ, but God is not mocked, a person reaps what they sow, as we heard in Galatians. If we're casual with sin, is that going to end well for us? Well, obviously, it's not going to lead us anywhere good or helpful. And so Jesus presents himself to this church here in Thyatira in a way that shows he is very serious about their sin. Firstly, there is his perfect sight. In verse 18, he introduces himself. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, he says. Jesus has eyes that penetrate all the moral confusion around us, He sees right from wrong. He knows up from down. He's always perfectly oriented. And he wants everyone to know in verse 23, I am he who searches hearts and minds. So we don't understand ourselves. We don't always have an accurate view of where we are at the moment. But Jesus understands us perfectly and therefore he judges us perfectly. So the thought of the blazing eyes of Jesus looking on his church seeing all that we do and seeing into our hearts and minds should have a sobering and purifying effect on us as his people. Even a little bit of sin should be intolerable to us if we know that we are under that gaze of the blazing eyes of Jesus. Because, of course, it's not just his perfect sight, it's then his perfect judgment that we need to fear. Jesus tells his church about his judgment on Jezebel and her followers here. Firstly, in verse 21... He'd given her time to repent of her sexual immorality, but she was unwilling. She was committed to her lusts and convinced by her own arguments. And so, uh, secondly, in verse 22, she'll be given a different bed to lie in with her followers this time. It will be a bed of great suffering. Her unrepentant followers would join her in her suffering and her children, her disciples, would be struck dead. Very blunt language from Jesus. It's hard to know exactly what Jesus was threatening here. Perhaps it was an actual illness that he was threatening to inflict certain people with. But whatever it was, it was going to be public enough for all the churches to know that Jesus is the one who examines hearts and minds and he will give each to, uh, to each of you according to what you have done, he says. So this, this would be a warning to you. He, he starts talking to you, whoever's reading this letter. Uh, your works matter says Jesus. In verse 18, uh, Jesus is introduced not only as the one with eyes that blaze like fire, but with feet like burnished bronze, that is, feet for trampling on evil, which is his job as the judge. The parable of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew 18 um, tells us that the church is not going to be fully weeded until judgment day, But Jesus is still able to do a bit of weeding now. And I think that's what we're being uh, told in this letter. And that's what he's promising to do here in in Thyatira. He's going to remove Jezebel and her followers as an example to Christians everywhere. So he's not just a passive spectator of what's going on in his churches. He is not confused and unsure about what to do about what's going on in his churches. He's very ready to exercise patience where that's the right thing and then judgment where that's what's needed. And that should make us um, very aware of our own sin, I think, if we actually take this seriously, and very intolerant of our sin, very repentant. To those in this church who hadn't been sucked in by Jezebel's deception, but who'd nevertheless permitted it to keep going, Jesus gives a simple command in this letter. Verses 24 and 25. I will not impose any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come, he says. In other words, I think the secret to fighting sin and living holy lives is not complicated. You don't need to learn any extra deep things 
in order to, to live well as a Christian. You just need to hold tight to the gospel, which is what you have. Perhaps we sometimes think that there must be a secret, um, some extra thing that we need to learn in order to defeat sin and to, to get it all working properly because we feel like it's not. But in Titus 2, it says, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live sober, righteous and godly lives. Jesus is saying here, just hold on to that, to what you have. It's enough. Uh, if pilots fly into clouds and come out, uh, uh, come out again upside down because they don't look at their instruments, the gospel is the instrument that we need to keep our eyes on to stay clear about sin and holiness. We get very confused at times. We look for answers in techniques or in secrets or extra teaching, but Jesus is never confused. He sees sin for what it is. We should think of the blazing eyes and the, the, the bronze feet. We shouldn't play with sin or tolerate it. Uh, we should speak up in love wherever we see sin and help each other to repent of our sin because Jesus, you can be sure, sees that sin as well. So that's the second reason that we should uh, take a zero-tolerance approach to sin. And the third is that we will share his rule one day. Uh, like the other letters, this one ends with a promise to the one who overcomes, that is the one who holds on to the gospel and doesn't lose the plot on sin. There's a promise. And it points us to an incredible privilege. Um, in fact, such a privilege that is coming to us that it should put us off sin for life. The first element of the Christian's privilege in eternity is authority. Uh, heaven will not be about Jesus serving us, which is a popular conception of heaven. I'll just sit on a cloud or wherever and grapes will be brought to me, uh, as if it's a, it's a hotel. No, we will serve Jesus in heaven, um, just as he shares his ministry with us now. He shared his ministry with his disciples. He shares his ministry with his church. So in eternity, Jesus will share his work with us, his people. And the nature of that ministry is that we will rule the new creation on Christ's behalf. Um, at the start of this letter, Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. Um, in Psalm 2, God's reaction to the rebellion of the nations uh, is to install his king, that is his son, who will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery. Um, and that language is reflected here at the end of the letter to Thyatira. Jesus says, that's me. Uh, and I will share that judging and ruling with my faithful followers who do my works to the end rather than the works of Jezebel. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Jesus refers to his disciples sitting on thrones and judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And those who are faithful in this life will be given charge of cities in the next life. The more faithful, the more cities you'll be given charge of in the next. And the Lord's people will judge the world says Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, we may not be looking for that sort of responsibility in eternity. Um, in fact, we might like the idea of a fairly quiet eternity. But the way that God has made us is that to be at rest requires us to be at work. Um, human beings are wired that way. We can only sit around for so long, you know. Um, it's actually to have fulfilling work where we find our rest as human beings, and I guess that he will give us what we need to do the job in eternity, and the work will satisfy us, and so it'll be work, but it'll be restful at the same time. That's, that's, how, that's our ideal mode as human beings. And the question is, if you will have that great privilege in eternity, how should that make you want to live your life now? If you are going to be sit, uh, seated on a throne in eternity, and You'll be given authority over the nations. And, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like or feel like, but that's what we're told. If that's where you're going, then you will not want to live in shameful sin now. If you're going to sit on a throne and judge the world for Christ in the future, we need to aim upwards if that's where we're going. And there will be glory. Verse 28, he'll give us the morning star, which means that he'll give us himself because he's the bright morning star. But perhaps the aspect of that we're being pointed towards here is, the, is his glory. And again, if glory in Christ is our destiny, it should make us want nothing to do with sin now. Where am I going? So how should I live now? 
So there's a warning here in this letter about how easily we can be led into moral confusion and lose the plot. And there's also a vision of Christ in the present who sees and who judges sin. And there's a vision of the future in Christ in eternity. And the overall effect should be that we redouble our efforts and eradicate sin in our lives. What does this require of us? Well, um, the church office has a photocopier like every office does. And I was standing in front of it one day with Stephen Liggins. <clears throat> I think maybe I was making a copy of something and, and which I wanted to hand to him. And I stuck in the original and I pressed start and it started making this whirring noise, but nothing came out. And I'm sort of looking at, and I'm, you know, what's this thing doing? I say grumpily. And there on the screen it says, please wait, performing self-check. Um, and I sort of groaned grumpily. Stephen was very understanding. He said, well, it's not a bad thing for all of us to do from time to time. <laughs> and uh, never a true word spoken. <clears throat> How would we know whether there's a Jezebel in our life or in our church, bewitching us and confusing us so that we don't know what's up and what's down and what's wrong and what's right? Unless we step back and perform a self-check and look at things from or through the eyes of Jesus... Uh, how often do you stop and do that yourself? Um, and how often do we stop and do that as a church? What do we need to repent of? Where are we, are we being led astray? Jesus is not confused. Sin is the enemy, and he sees it clearly. And the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And our job for eternity will be to stand for righteousness on Christ's behalf. So surely that's what we ought to be doing now. And that's why we can't take a permissive attitude towards sin. It can't just be suppression, and it certainly shouldn't be herd immunity. It has to be eradication. That's, that needs to be our attitude. So let's pray that God helps us to glorify Christ in that way. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have saved us from our sin and that in Christ we are forgiven from our sin and we don't need to fear condemnation. Uh, but in light of that, Father, we pray that the effect of your grace would be to teach us to say no to ungodliness and to hate our sin. Father, we confess so easily we are confused, but we pray that you'd help us to, to regularly see things the way that you do and to repent of our sin and to help one another lovingly to repent of our sins. Uh, and we pray that in the process we would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.